My name is Joshua Moore. I work at Alternative Behavioral Therapy, where I own and operate it. You're listening to Neuro Noodle Network Podcast. Welcome to Neuro Noodles Neurofeedback and Neuropsychology Podcast, featuring neuropsychologist Dr. Laura Jansen's tech with Santiago Bron, neurofeedback legend Jay Gunkelman. Our goal is to provide information and promote options for better mental health. This is an all-star cast that are more than happy to share their knowledge with you. My name is Pete, and today we have a very special guest, Joshua Moore, founder and owner of Alternative Behavioral Therapy. But before we get to Joshua, we have a couple sponsors for the show. Mary Tracy's Neuro Training Strategies offers a higher standard of EEG, QEG education to EEG clinicians, technicians, and neurofeedback practitioners with convenient online BCIA and QEG certified didactic courses. Now let's not forget April 8th, it's getting close. The Super Brain Summit 6th Annual at Bradley University featuring Dr. Bruce Wexler, a psychiatrist at Yale Medical School. He'll discuss neurotherapeutics. How can we regulate the brain with computers? Register now at bradley.edu slash superbrainsummit. This gives us five stars on Apple Podcasts. It really helps get the word out. If they can't hear us, can't help them. And subscribe to our YouTube channel. For whatever reason, you subscribe to that YouTube channel. Bam, everybody's watching. Everybody's watching. Guys, Seaburn Fisher will be joining us for the month of April. We get a head start on Mental Health Awareness Month. Woo-hoo-hoo. Very excited. On uh, today's show, we got Joshua Moore, very good friend of ours, long-term friend, Patreon supporter, has bought us a couple cups of coffee. He's got an awesome uh, uh, clinic out in the Northwest. I've known Jay for, for a long time. Joshua Moore, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Glad to be here. Hey, tell us about uh, your, your, your uh, place out in uh, Washington. Well, it started about 12 years ago. I worked under the mentorship of Dr. Lisa Black, which some people may know, especially if they've been in the neurofeedback community a while. She's not the most out in the open person. Uh, she likes to work, you know, uh, out in a tiny little clinic out in Oklahoma, you know, but if you've been around, you know, for a few decades, you probably know her. Uh, and so I went and did my internship out in Oklahoma and stayed in a brand new little town it called Moore, Oklahoma, which is always brand new. And it's always been brand new because it gets mowed over by tornadoes every two or three years. And uh, I did uh, phone consultations and Zoom consultations with her uh, pretty consistently. Uh, and uh, then again, when I started doing brain mapping, I did that for about a year or two. And now I, I, I try to get my training a little more eclectically around from different places. And I try not to push it all on poor Dr. Lisa. Where is Vancouver, Washington? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, Cause everyone thinks I'm Canadian. I think yeah. you don't talk right, you know? <laughs> uh, so Vancouver, Washington is essentially just two miles from Portland, Oregon. So we're, we're right there uh, about two exits from Oregon, uh, right above Portland, Oregon. Now, how did you get into neurofeedback and EEGs? What, why'd you get into this uh, wonderful world? So I was an orthopedic specialist and a combat medic in the military. And my current Thank job- Thank you for your service. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, my current job was doing the life flights at Walter Reed. So I would do life flight triage. Uh, if someone stepped on a landmine and got blown up, they would get a tourniquet put on, they get taken to a forward operating base. Uh, they get emergency life flight to either the burn ward at BAM C down in uh, Texas or Longstool, Germany, forward surgical, or they'd come straight to me or they'd end up with me eventually uh, out there in Walter Reed. And these giant semi trucks, they were actual semi truck ambulances that only took maybe two people at a time would uh, transport them from the airport uh, to me at the hospital where I would, you know, based on a very, very limited amount of data, which was usually wrong, <laughs> would have things ready to do uh, life flight triage and uh, prepare them for treatment or prepare them for surgery, try to change wound care dressings and essentially keep them alive until surgery that morning. When you're done with that job, the military doesn't really give you anything interesting to do ever again. They kind of let you watch people run around a track. So I moved into the reserves, came back home, and to kill some time, I did some hospice care work. And I'd been home for maybe two, three weeks. Somebody came into town and was treating people for pain, and their pain levels were just going down beyond what was possible. Uh, it just didn't seem like this should work. I, I remember uh, one individual that I was particularly close to was like, this was the most morphine they can have. They're not allowed to have any more. 
and they just went off of it. They weren't on any more of it. And they were days later, they're still off their morphine. And I'm okay. I'm not understanding what happened here. I figured out who was responsible, who did what. And then I essentially harassed them until they agreed to train me on what they did. That person was Dr. Lisa Black, who ended up moving back to Oklahoma. I remember calling her when she got back into Oklahoma and saying, hey, so uh, how do I learn how to do this? You said you were going to train me. And she said, well, it's actually more complicated than it may have led on. Uh, you know, you probably need to do a lot of stuff before you can be ready. I said, okay, what's the next thing I have to do? So she said, read these books. So I read them all and gave her a call the next month. I said, well, what's the next thing I have to do? She said, well, you got to take these classes. So I took the online classes and called her and said, what's the next thing I have to do? And this kind of kept going on for a few months until she said, well, you have to have a graduate degree. So I called her the next month and said, I'm enrolled in a graduate program. What do you want me to do now? <laughs> and so she's like, okay, you have to come out and stay in Oklahoma and work at this clinic here. <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> so, so that's what I ended up doing. I, I think she remembers it differently than me. And I, I really do wonder where the truth is, but that's my memory of it. Joshua, curious, what were the books? Oh, uh, so the neurofeedback book by the Thompsons. And I, I had to go to like Starbucks, you know, like every morning and like clock in and read it. And I had to have three colored highlighters and three colored pens. It was like the only way that I could actually like, fit that information into my brain was to have like a laptop and a tablet and constantly be looking things up while I'm circling and highlighting, underlining as I'm going. <clears throat> and I noticed that my ability to move through that textbook sped up <laughs> as I continue to work through it, uh, it, it, it definitely wasn't something that uh, it was, it wasn't obvious that I could read that until I was about halfway through it. I'm doing so the same thing with Niedermeyer right now. And oh, yeah. same feeling. <laughs> <So> <laughs> Thanks, Jay. That's Jay's fault, by the way. So what do we got to do to get uh, neurofeedback in front of more vets? Yeah. Well, by vets, do you mean, you mean uh, like uh, PTSD, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, what do we got to do to, is it being adapted in the military, you know, to, to help out these poor guys that come back, guys and gals that come back for, for PTSD? Well, I mean, I mean, as I always tell my staff, you can if you want to. If there's a will, there's a way. I think that locally you can see it applied. I know that people like Jay have specifically worked with the military before. Um, and I know many, many people who've mentored me have had military contracts before as well. But if you want to work with vets, you can just work with vets. It doesn't mean you're going to get paid, but you can do it. <laughs> well, no, what I'm saying is you were a Walter Reed what. Mm -hmm. Are they doing it at Walter Reed? Oh, that's a good question. Um, they were doing a lot of interesting things at Walter Reed. They did far infrared light therapy. They were doing hyperbaric oxygen therapy. You know, and Jay's probably wondering where I got my fascination for hyperbaric oxygen therapy. And that's actually where it was, is that we, we had access to low pressure hyperbaric oxygen and high pressure hyperbaric oxygen uh, for head injuries and wound care at Walter Reed. And people are like, that's off label. I'm like, yeah, it was the military. They didn't really care. Yeah. And especially the light therapy, which is one that would surprise you. They had thousands and thousands of these little LED light therapy devices that they would use uh, to increase circulation um, at different parts of the body or on the head. And at one point they transitioned from uh, Walter Reed in DC to moving it to Bethesda hospital. They actually integrated it. And I was part of the closing group. And they didn't need them because they already had the same infrared light systems over there. So they decided they were just going to throw them away. And I remember the pile was taller than I was. And they had guards that were standing 100 feet away from it so that no one could take pictures of what they were throwing away. They didn't want anyone taking pictures of it. <laughs> they were horrified they were going to get ended. They end up in the newspaper for their waste. <laughs> okay, uh, now, weird stuff. Now, now, Joshua, you... You said mm -hmm. you, you helped 50 people get into the neurofeedback field. Is that true? Yeah, about that. Yeah, that's probably about that's probably about accurate. Um, so over the years, um, we take a few interns. Uh, it didn't go so well in the beginning. I think we had to let go of some interns. Uh, but eventually, we kind of learned how to teach people how to get into this industry. Um, Ainsley Silva is a name that maybe pops up here and there. Sarah Massey is another person to be one of the first people that 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 kind of got into the industry because I was working here and uh, they just expressed a lot of interest. They kind of badgered me probably like I badgered Dr. Lisa a little bit. And um, <clears throat> before too long, they were working at my clinic part-time doing some sort of internship. And then eventually they started their own clinic or practice after, um, after a few success stories, maybe 10 years ago or eight years ago, we started having staff more regularly. 
And, and I've kind of always had what I believe in what's called the law of plenty, or I've heard Jay say something similar like the competition. Is that what you say, Jay? Competition. Yes. Yeah. I've always said the law of plenty, uh, you know, and I've always believed, you know, there's, there's 250 registered massage therapists in our tiny little town. Uh, you know, um, how much bigger of a scope do we have than them? And we should be fine. Uh, we can, we can, we can stand to have a little bit of competition as long as we're all doing a good job. And so our fixation shouldn't be on whether or not there's competition. Our fixation should be whether or not our competition is doing a good job or not. Uh, and that should be the case until we reach a saturation point, which we are by no means anywhere near at all. Yeah. And that's been my belief for the last 10 years. And so I've, I readily volunteered my time to train um, people that I thought were skilled or talented. I'm at the point now where People that I've mentored now have six or seven people that they're mentoring actively, or they have six or seven staff at their clinics right now. Those are the first people that I trained. So, um, you know, some people have two or three, some people have four or five, but the ones that are the, the first people I trained have six or seven people working under them. Um, <clears throat> so we have quite a big amount of dense, large clinics in our local area that there's at least three clinics uh, within a few miles that have seven employees. And until, and until two months ago, uh, two of them were in the same building because we just didn't see any reason not to. So that, that, that law of plenty or that competition, we took it very, very seriously where I, I let one of my main competitors just rent from, you know, the suite across the hall. Like I, I believed that I really did believe that. And it didn't seem to affect us negatively. So I think we had 15 or 14 actual full-time neurofeedback providers in the same building and they were busy. <laughs> and what is dissociation? Uh, so my specialty, uh, I work with dissociative identity disorder or dissociative PTSD. Uh, and I don't know that that's extremely common. Uh, I think there's probably lots of people even listening to this podcast who might just tune out at this point because. Uh, no, no, been... no. We all, all types are listening. You know, talk <laughs> yeah, to I know. Dr. Tenure. Well, it, it's, a, it's a diagnosis that um, has gone through a decade or two, at least once or twice where um, where it's maybe been disregarded or, or ignored or or um, or there's been a, a, a strong belief that it's not uh, a valid diagnosis you know to have somebody who say switches personalities multiple personality disorder uh, is is kind of the old name for dissociative identity disorder <clears throat> which is something that I do actually specialize in and I use psychotherapy and neurofeedback with currently. And I do that in an individual private practice. And I've had to take, um, you know, some of the research that's out there, which I could cite and, you know, say who gave the inspiration for it. <laughs> and then how did I take their research and took maybe some like the group uh, self-exploration pieces and had to modify it to fit individual private practices, which, which um, again, it wasn't obvious how that was going to work when I started, but it, but it worked out. We've had a relatively high success rate working with um, the dissociative identity population. Um, you know, we, we find that somewhere around, you know, 80, 90 percent of them have success within a relatively short period of time getting normalized DES or dissociative evaluation scale um, normalized, you know, essentially presenting as one person again. And, and so, that's done through, you know, a, a couple different types of not neurofeedback. For, for the moms and dads out there, what, what are the symptoms? Of DID? Yeah. Well, I mean, there's, there's probably um, depends on, uh, I think you could think of there's as two types. I think some people describe it as having DID NOS, which might be someone who I, I have voices in my head that talk about what I'm doing or criticize what I'm doing. <clears throat> and, um, and they're very distinct and they're very separate from myself. And, this process uh, is very distressing. And um, I also have very fractured memories. And if I take this test, which we like to give our patients called the dissociative evaluation scale, they'll score really, really high <laughs> on this particular test. And, and, and the test itself, I refer to as a psychoeducational test, because taking the test helps you see where you're dissociative, because you might not know that you're dissociative. You, this is the only experience you've ever had. You are you, you know, <laughs> Um, but when you take the test, you start to realize like, oh, are, are, are some of these things not normal? Like, do people not talk to themselves when they're alone out loud? Um, no, no, they don't. Um, that's, that's something that, that not might mean something, you know, especially if you put it in, you know, together with, you know, 15 other things, you know, <clears throat> that are also a little bit not quite normal. It amounts to getting a score on this test 
that goes down at the end of treatment. But if you have, uh, say, the DID NOS individuals or people who probably had trauma a little bit later in life, like six or seven, and usually they're experiencing some pretty substantial trauma like sexual abuse. That's not, it's not exclusive to that, but typically it's something pretty substantial. And there's uh, something that a child's brain couldn't handle, like an adult problem that was just so big that this child's brain couldn't handle. And so the only thing that they could do is just kind of move past it and move forward. And um, <clears throat> as, if, as, if, as if it didn't happen. But in doing so, they kind of fracture themselves and leave parts of themselves kind of uh, separated uh, from the part that moves forward. And they end up with kind of a fractured identity and they don't know how to put that back together later uh, because it causes too much increased arousal and they can't manage that arousal without neurofeedback and without some sort of hypnagogic training like alpha theta. What, so, what's, showing up, what's showing up on the EEG? Like what area oh, of the brain? That's, what's a, that's a really, really, really good question. Uh, and I, I have, I have wanted so, 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 so badly to do a 19 channel assessment, but, um, there is not been the ability to get the consent to do that. I have seen some like anecdotal studies and things like that. Oh, that, that when they're switching personalities for the parts, for, for patients who have DID, uh, uh, that actually switch parts, that there's some Delta bursts that occur. Um, I've heard people claim that there's a different brain map for each part. I'm not sure I'd buy that, but I've not, I've not been able to do a full cap evaluation, uh, because I'm very, very self-conscious about doing things for my own curiosity's sake. I was waiting for Jay to pop in. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I need to, me too. <laughs> Come on, Jay. <laughs> Tell us more, Jay. <laughs> I don't know that, that, um, your tracking, uh, uh, DID goes back to Brownback and Mason. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, but yeah. uh, they, they were the ones who were in the neurofeedback field first really looking at uh, dissociative identity disorder related yeah. features. Mm -hmm. um, uh, their work was interesting, mm -hmm. but it wasn't really picked up within the neurofeedback world as a, as, as a, as a common protocol. Um, mm -hmm. at, at, as the, the, there are some people that hate the term protocol because it suggests that there for this disorder there's this treatment and mm -hmm. uh, it isn't a one-to-one -one. there's not a distinct specific treatment for it because it has to be matched to the individual uh, PTSD that leads to uh, dissociation is mm -hmm. not uncommon uh, right. fight flight is what everybody hears about you know uh, your, your cortisol goes up and you're ready to fight uh, or, or or flee. Yeah. But if you can't fight and you can't flee, the next step for the nervous system is fight, flight, freeze. Mm -hmm. And animals that are trapped and can't get away uh, usually have a parasympathetic end point to their, it's, it's, a, it's a sympathetic over arousal. But if you get the freeze, that's parasympathetic. Literally, it scares the shit out of you. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, peristalsis. So uh, the, the person plays dead um, mm -hmm. and they quite often defecate or urinate. Mm -hmm. um, and, and these are normal responses to self-protect. If, if you'll see a mouse uh, freeze in position and crap on the floor when they can't get away from the cat, mm -hmm. sometimes the cat ignores them after that and they can get away. Uh, it, it's a natural uh, uh, circumstance to have fight, flight, freeze if there's a significant enough stressor. Mm -hmm. And then obviously the freeze aspect of that is the dissociation. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the person actually feels out of themselves. They feel separate from themselves during that state. So, uh, and yeah, obviously if, if you're about to be devoured by a cat, uh, or uh, some severe trauma is about to, you know, uh, eviscerate you or something. You don't want to be there. So uh, uh, dissociation is a, it's an adaptive state. Uh, it's not one you would pick if you're thinking of fighting or fleeing, but if you can't do either of those, it's your other alternative. And again, uh, it's the freeze state. And uh, uh, there are a lot of people who didn't, really catch that part of the 
the the model of PTSD. Uh, the, you know, the, the stressor and the jacking your nervous system up and the, the a, a fear and anger and all those kind of primary emotions. But the, the freeze endpoint is, is something lost on some. Very good. All right. Hi, Josh. Uh, yeah, I'm Dr. Laura. Uh, I'm a neuropsychologist, so I, I come at things a little bit differently. Actually, let me, I'm going to sidebar here for a second. Sure. Uh, you're on the West Coast, right, Josh? Right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. You know, I'm putting together a theory. Um, mm -hmm. The, the folks on the coast seem a little bit more open to um, neurofeedback. That, that's a theory, and you guys can uh, you know, jump in. And I would agree. Yeah, there wasn't, there wasn't yeah. much of it in my town, which I was like perplexed by, because even I thought, oh, man, there's probably tons of it in my hometown once I learned of it, because you know, yeah. that's my belief about the Northwest. And there yeah. wasn't anybody. There was some yeah. practitioners who'd recently retired or had gotten ill and, and couldn't right. practice anymore. And there was nothing. I was like, what? That's crazy. How could this be? Yeah. yeah. Let's take a break in the action to tell you about the Super Brain Summit at Bradley University. You can check it out online at bradley.edu slash superbrainsummit. It's happening this April 8th. Featured speaker will be Dr. Bruce Wexler, an international expert on digital neurotherapeutics, and he's a psychiatrist at Yale School of Medicine. Hey, visit the Brain Cave, walk through the brain using Oculus Quest. How cool. Check it out April 8th, bradley.edu slash superbrainsummit. So yeah, I don't want to stereotype, but I, I guess I, I feel like in, in the Midwest here, we, we want to... We want to see it. We want proof before we, you know, come in and, and do these things. Yeah. So, so we're trying to build practice in the Midwest here. I'm near Chicago and, and we're, we're growing, but it's, it's, uh, it's always nice to hear, you know, the folks who, who are buried in, in work and, and, uh, and I, I, I'm guessing it has something to do with people who are a little more progressive moved to the coast or at least that's what I'm telling myself. But, mm -hmm. but I'm thinking about your, your cases with your dissociative identity disorder and I'm a neuropsychologist, so I do a lot of uh, paper and pencil testing, you know, the traditional mm -hmm. stuff where, you know, draw me a picture of a house and a tree and a person and all of that. Yeah. And um, I actually a had lot a of case. that in the, in the practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I bet. Yeah. So with the dissociative identity, I, I guess, you know, the, the cues or the imaging would have something to do with, you know, something in the right hemisphere being out of whack. You know, we just talked about the amygdala and those things. Um, it, when I think about it, I think the right hemisphere has to do with dealing with the environment and the left hemisphere has to do with your habits and routine. So your inner world's on the left, you're dealing with the external world's on the right. We have that stuff going on. And then I think about the default mode network and kind of where do we wander uh, when we're supposedly doing nothing. And so we can have some effects there. And we know um, Bessel van der Kolk's um, picture we've talked about that many times on this show that mm -hmm. you're gonna have an amygdala dysregulated and a front left dysregulated and you know the freeze response where you can't say anything is the front left so so I, I think about you know th those kind of pictures um, we've had a case recently of a schizophrenic who had an insula uh, disturbance in the right side so mm -hmm. the part of the brain that has to do with who am I what am I uh, am I, you know, related to myself? Am I related to you? It, um, and so it's interesting. Uh, I don't know if you guys have, you know, done any specific drawings, but w when I've um, had people who've, who've kind of been disconnected from themselves, that their their drawings, they, you know, for example, they'd have no faces, it's like mm -hmm. I don't exist kind of thing. Um, and I'm not related to the world. I'm not related to you. I'm just kind of floating in outer space. So, so uh, I get curious about, you know, you talk about dissociative identity, you know, and yeah. well, there's, there's a lot of uh, practice and integration of psychotherapy with this. And one of the key pieces, um, you know, there has to be some sort of neurofeedback protocol to reduce arousal. And there's a lot of things that we do for that one. Um, of course, the integrative protocol is alpha theta. But how do you get them to the point where you can actually do any of that at all? And uh, there's a lot of art therapy. Um, and they, believe it or not, if you don't instigate some sort of art therapy, they will just do it. They will, they'll, just show, they'll just show up with pictures. They'll just do it. They will. Um, but I, I will encourage them to, uh, um, to draw pictures. Um, uh, some people call it like the conference table. Most of them, in, in my opinion, gravitate more towards like an inner house. 
where they're trying to achieve some sort of inner union with their internal family system. Um, I externalize that using sand tray play therapy. So I'll just put a sandbox out in the middle of the room, put about 50 to 100 little toys that you get at a garage sale. And I will say, this is your mind and what's in your mind. Can you show me what's going on? <clears throat> and then from that point on, I, I don't interact with it uh, directively and I don't touch it. And um, they will do quite a lot more externally than they ever could do in their head. Um, and it's, it's quite an interesting experience to watch. You have to get quite a bit of training in play therapy before you can uh, do that with somebody though, because you'll make some classic mistakes and uh, it won't go well. <laughs> I mean, you might know about that. <laughs> um, but, but just like the uh, images should change with DID, they're not likely to draw a faceless person. They're likely to draw like 20 people <laughs> and, and they're not getting along. <laughs> uh, and what you want is for them to draw, you know, 20 people in a circle doing some sort of group hug, which is, you know, pretty archetypal of what they're probably going to end up drawing at the end of their therapy. <clears throat> that there is a unified system where um, all of these parts are um, aware of everything that they all know and they share the same value systems or they are um, connected to each other's value system enough to have harmony. And that the presence is of a single person uh, because they make up that single person. The yeah. question that I have for the moms and dads out there, and we haven't talked about this on the show. I'm not, I don't even remember what it's called. What happens when people are pulling their hair out? What's that called? And why do they do it? Trichotillomania. What, what's going on? Uh, trichotillomania is a form of an obsessive compulsive disorder. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it, it's different if you look at it at rest versus when they're doing it. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you actually see the trichotillomania marker at the anterior cingulate when they're at rest. And the thing is, when they grab a chunk of hair and start to twirl it, it disappears. They relieve the pressure mm. by doing the behavior. So if you want to see the trichotillomania biomarker, don't have them twirling their hair when, they're, when you're looking, because that's, that relieves the drive. Uh, if you have them not do it, and they start to feel like they should or could or have to do it, uh, when they feel that compulsion, at that point, you'll see the pressure. And the anterior cingulate can fail with theta or alpha or beta. Uh, the anterior cingulate gives you cognitive and emotional flexibility. And this is a locked on. You can be locked off and have lo no motivation, no initiation, uh, a kinetic mutism as the logical extreme. But if you're locked on, you have an obsessive compulsive uh, drive, basically. And again, the same look, whether it's theta or alpha or beta, you can't differentiate based on the form of OCD. There's one form of OCD. What other disorder in the DSM hasn't replicated? You know, two, three, four, five different kinds. There's only one kind of OCD. Mm -hmm. uh, so you, you literally have one thing, we can see three different varieties of it that predict different medication interventions. The alpha pattern responds to SSRI very well, anterior cingulate, anterior alpha. It responds well, hypercoherent alpha at the anterior cingulate, especially if it's slightly slower than 10. Uh, if it's faster than 10, you might have to do a tetracycline instead of a, instead of a, a, a regular SSRI. Uh, if it's way slow, uh, but it's still alpha, an SNRI may be needed, uh, serotonin and norepinephrine for reuptake. But, if you have a theta pattern, you tend to not respond to, to traditional medication intervention. Now, they'll give you an SSRI. You won't respond to it, but they might leave you on it. You know, I, it, it, if you try a medication that doesn't work, why are you still on it? You know, um, the theta pattern essentially is a non-responding group. Leslie Pritchett took OCD, a group of OCD patients, and did a cluster analysis and said, find two clusters. Well, of course, a cluster analysis is going to find two because that's what it does. The question isn't, will it find two? It will. The question is, are they meaningful? I mean, uh, is it just dividing it into male and female? You know, well, big deal. It's male OCD and female OCD. No big difference. Well, what they find is that 
there's a slow pattern that less than 15% of them respond to the SSRI class. And if it's an alpha pattern, 85% of them respond. That's a significant difference clinically. The beta pattern wasn't seen in find me two patterns. The beta pattern was seen by others later, including myself. And uh, the beta spindle pattern, basically, if you give an SSRI to them, it's not that they won't respond. They'll respond, but they're not going to respond the way you want them to. This is, they'll, they'll melt down. They'll have an anxiety attack and over arousal you know, in, on spades. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's just way, way, way a wrong medication class. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have beta spindles, you may respond to an antipsychotic if you don't have transients. But if you have a transients, you have to have an anticonvulsant. Uh, if it's just beta spindles, you may respond to a channel blocker. Clonidine has been uh, popularized by Bessel van der Kolk group uh, to deal with uh, PTSD, with beta spindles. Um, uh, it works with the OCD beta spindle pattern as well. So uh, <clears throat> the EG will identify the problem and where it is. And it will also tell you what medication <coughs> classes will work with it. And obviously, uh, o OCD ends up being the drive mechanism for the trichotillomania. I didn't know that it went away when they twirled their hair until somebody who doesn't do QEG, which is sit there, don't do anything, eyes open, eyes closed, resting state. Um, but uh, uh, Hassan Asif in, in uh, New York uh, was doing a recording mm. And uh, the, the patient grabbed some hair and started to twirl it, and the theta went away at the anterior cingulate. And uh, that observation basically was enough for us to end up looking at it, and we got that same replication. Mm -hmm. the, the obsessive compulsive behavior, the, the compulsion to do it when, it actually, when you actually you do it, uh, it relieves the pressure uh, to, to do something. Uh, nowadays, uh, uh, if you have an alpha or a theta pattern at the anterior cingulate, they can point a big magnet at that. It has to have the right kind of coil, a double cone coil or an H coil can shoot a deep enough pulse to actually get to the cingulate. And uh, treating people that have OCD with TMS tends to work well. It, it's not a permanent fix necessarily but uh, getting any kind of a fix at all with OCD is, is quite a task. And um, when you say uh, not permanent, does that mean that the, uh, uh, the symptoms come back? Um, yeah, uh, uh, you're, you're, gonna, um, you're gonna have success, but it won't sustain itself long-term. <clears throat> wow. And the, it's basically the same kind of thing they see with TMS with, with depression. Um, uh, uh, yeah, combining it with other therapies may end up maintaining the, the benefit better. But if you just rely on the TMS alone, you get a, a temporary relief, but it's a relief. And, you know, if you get a relief, whew, I got a relief, you know, uh, uh, better than no relief. Uh, but it, it, again, it, it's, it requires the right technology and those aren't inexpensive toys. Mm -hmm. uh, TMS are the, the least expensive. You can probably walk out the door with one. It's about a hundred thousand. And the more common uh, big name brands are 250 or so. So it's, it's not cheap. And as such, the therapy is not, um, not inexpensive therapy either. It's very, uh, very pricey. And insurance may cover it for depression. OCD is actually approved for treatment for uh, TMS by the FDA, but insurance won't cover it. Mm -hmm. And I mean, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Oh, feel free to do it, but we won't pay for it, you know? So, uh, uh, and goodness knows you don't want to pay a full freight at a, at a TMS practice because right. that that's quite expensive. Um, it's not the only way to treat the anterior cingulate. Mm -hmm. we, we referred somebody to a TMS practice, um, uh, telling them that it was the anterior cingulate problem. We had maps and everything. And they said, well, uh, we're, we're restricted to the FDA protocol for depression, left frontal. Well, it's not the right spot. You know, it's not very far off. Just point the magnet at the right spot with the right kind of magnet, you'd have success. Uh, but uh, they did 36 sessions, which is all you get paid for with no effect whatsoever. We, we told the gentleman that he could try TDCS, the mm -hmm. DC stem uh, on the, uh, onto, the, onto the cortex. And um, it worked. 
uh, from session number one on, he had good relief from DC Stim. Uh, it cost him 200 bucks for the device from China and about 50 bucks for some adapter cables uh, from a supplier. And uh, he was all hooked up and, and, and found relief for less than the copay for a single session for TMS. So, uh, you, you know, it, uh, it's not always the big toys that end up the expensive toys that end up being the thing that work. Um, the thing is DC stim is, is, it's hard to get high level research. There's lots of small studies. What does a graduate student afford? You can't mm -hmm. afford a TMS machine. You can't even afford time on a TMS machine. So a uh, $200 box from China, uh, you're, you're up and running. Uh, DC stim has a lot of small research projects. Mm -hmm. Um, if you look at the, the published literature, it's, it's exploded in neuroscience with TGCS. TMS is expo expanding rapidly as well. Uh, the studies there are uh, usually more structured. Um, there's more expense. Uh, the, the manufacturers fund studies in TMS. They can afford to fund studies. Um, when you sell one machine that doesn't cost you that much to make, and you're selling it for two hundred fifty thousand dollars. There's a lot of a lot of profit there. Mm -hmm. You know, a couple hundred thousand dollars of profit, easy. Uh, so, uh, um, so the uh, a, a lot of studies could be paid by that. DC mm -hmm. stem devices. There's no profit margin. I mean, there's a lot of people make them. You can make one yourself at home. Uh, real simple circuit. Um, but uh, um, there's, there's no company to fund things at that point. So uh, it's more like biofeedback and neurofeedback, which are clinician funded studies, which I have to commend you for, Jonathan. <laughs> uh, not everybody sets up uh, a study. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I know a lot of clinicians. That, I don't think they know about that. <laughs> well, uh, uh, there, there's. Uh, That's okay. Uh, it's, it's okay. I won't push the issue. No, but, you're good. You're good. <laughs> um, uh, uh, um, you know, there's a lot of clinicians that have data coming through that they could study. Yeah. Not everybody studies their data. Yeah. You know, one of my first customers, after two years of work with me, mm -hmm. pulled out the file drawer all the way and grabbed three years of prior mm -hmm. standard protocol work and compared it to two years of work with protocols designed by the Q mm -hmm. and they found that they doubled their clinical efficacy or cut their failure rate in half. Yeah. Now mm -hmm. the, you don't find that kind of data unless you actually look in your file drawer, mm -hmm. you know? Um, uh, and, and it's unfortunate that there's a lot of data being produced without any intent to really play with the data. Um, mm -hmm. It's one case at a time. They have good clinical experience. Uh, they just keep going. And, um, uh, it, 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 it's good to actually try to structure a study with some randomization. Mm -hmm. If I'm a clinician and I've got two approaches that I could use, and I don't know which one works better, it's, there's no ethical problem randomizing people into one of the two protocols. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I have a study with randomization, an outcome study, mm -hmm. uh, which one of those two protocols works better for a specific application. You got data that you generate if you do the same thing with a whole bunch of practices, you can generate enough data to actually have a respectable study. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, uh, the neurofeedback world needs to generate uh, studies based on their clinical outcomes. Um, yeah, I, uh, I published uh, my recollections of 500,000 EEGs. There's these 11 common patterns, probably had genetic correlates. These are endophenotypes or candidate endophenotypes. And that's been studied. When, when you publish something, it makes predictions and the prediction can be tested. So uh, uh, it, it's, it's time for us to uh, uh, you know, take off the boxing glove and quit fighting with the rest of the field and join with them and pool your data together to actually get some good outcome studies that would get people in Chicago to have enough faith in the field, you know? So, mm -hmm. uh, uh, it, our, our, our field is unfortunately still competitive minded in a lot of ways. And I think it's to our own detriment. You know, yeah. uh, again, if, 
you're opening a practice and somebody moves in doing the same thing in the neighborhood, you become the, the, the antique district instead of the antique store. Mm-hmm. And people, oh, you got to get an antique, go to the antique district, you know, so they at least know where to go. Right now, they don't know who we are. They don't know what we do. They don't know how to get a hold of us. Um, and, and it shows, you know, mm-hmm. the, our, our, our market is uh, limited to a certain extent by our lack of development of our market. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so Jay and guys, so pulling the hair, that's an uh, obsessive uh, compulsive disorder. So it's not really a pain thing. What's the difference between that and then like self-harm? What is self-harm uh, for, for the moms? Mom and dad show, you know, what's, what's it, the difference? There's usually an OCD drive towards the self-harm as well. And typically okay. there's been a history of abuse added on. You can have OCD with no history of any problem. It's just a, a, an inherited trait. Um, uh, uh, you're you're going to be obsessive compulsive. Uh, but if you have uh, usually early life abuse of some sort, uh, uh, self-harm ends up being a very common uh, uh, finding. Um, it, 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 there's undoubtedly deep psychiatric stuff going into this uh, uh, that, that drive the self-harm. Um, uh, I, I, I don't look at that part of, uh, the world. Uh, I, am not a psychoanalyst. I'm an EG analyst mm-hmm. and, uh, the, the people who do the self-harm end up having the same OCD type drive that, that the, uh, uh that the trichotillomania person will have, but they usually also have the rest of the PTSD biomarkers, not just the OCD biomarker at the, at the frontal midline, uh, they'll have the right t- uh, temporal parietal junction, which is mm-hmm. the ability to perceive emotion properly in others and in yourself. Um, and uh, uh, also quite commonly because of the uh, uh, PTSD, they'll have a, a jumpy nervous system. You know, if, if somebody has uh, had trauma and you come up behind them and startle them, they will jump up and grab onto the chandelier like that you see in the cartoons, you know, they're, they're jumpy. And what happens is if your amygdala is really charged up full of emotion, it changes your thalamic gating. Your thalamus has a normal speed. It gets vision from your eye to the back of your head in about a hundred milliseconds. Well, if your amygdala is charged up with emotion, it gets there early and it gets there big. It's a jumpy nervous system. You have a, a, a large response to sensory inputs. So you have sensitivities and you, you see that uh, uh, basically in the back of the head, you don't see the amygdala, but you see the jumpy nervous system. Uh, they'll have visual hypervigilance and you see lambda waves in the back of the head, uh, larger and more common than would be usually seen. There's nothing abnormal about lambda. It's just a, a visual detection You've focused on something, you see a P100 wave, a uh, positive wave 100 milliseconds after the stimulus. Well, it's not going to be 100 milliseconds. It's going to be early, maybe 80, maybe 75, but that's way, way early, and it's going to be big. So you can see it in the raw EEG. So repetitive lambda is a biomarker for PTSD. And if the person's got PTSD to the point of self-harm cutting, uh, you're going to end up seeing usually hypervigilance and the PTSD biomarker and the obsessive compulsive drive. I, I would also add, if you're discussing this, you know, with like our, the parents that might be watching uh, self-harm, like cutting or scraping or burning or anything like that, associated more with like the neck, chest, genitals, thighs, or back are more commonly associated with intent to kill themselves than other types of self-harm. Um, like, and, and if someone is doing something for attention, it's totally valid to give them attention and, you know, scream for help is still a cry for help. Go give them help. Uh, but, yeah. um, but the, the injuring on their neck, chest, genitals, thighs, and back, uh, can be seen as something that requires like immediate, uh, serious help yeah. and, and possible institution. Uh, you need supervision for that one. You're, you're talking also about kind of the addictive, uh, systems, um, so the interior cingulate, like Jay mentioned, and uh, pain conditions and OCD kind of go hand in hand. And then I think we're also talking about a cerebellar uh, system as well, where cerebellum in the back of the head uh, regulates the rate, rhythm, and force of how you respond to something. 
And uh, I, I talk to actually a lot of teenagers who are self-harming and, and they'll say stuff like they, um, they'll cut so that they feel something. And so, you know, they don't uh, get pleasure in the, the, the uh, typical way. They'll, they'll kick off their endorphins by uh, cutting to feel the pain, which, you know, gives them a little boost of dopamine and, and a little um, kind of an addictive uh, piece to it. So, um, so there, there's tons of things going on when, you know, talking about the self-harm, right? And there's, there's categories where people are intending to kill themselves. People are trying to feel something. People get a little high, so to speak, from, from doing the cutting behavior. Um, there is certainly abuse in the histories and, and uh, maybe I'm not digging far enough, but I, I also can, you know, talk to a lot of kids and they're typically teenage girls and there's certainly boys who do it. But I, I have talked to a number of teenage girls who uh, there, there doesn't seem to be um, a lot of trauma in the past kind of thing. Um, you know, we, we start to talk about personality disorders where kids um, are de developing maladaptive ways of coping. And so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's not uncommon for a teenager to go through, um, you know, all, all the adolescent uh, problems that they can go through and conflicts and social problems. And we just had the pandemic. So it's not uncommon for kids to go through that. It's what do you, how do you express the conflicts that you have? Are you expressing it by you know, talking to a therapist, talking to your parents, talking appropriately to your peers, or you're expressing it in a way that um, is more primitive, where you, you're you kind of t expressing yourself by by causing pain to yourself or causing pain to others. And um, But then, you know, if you continually do this uh, expression, then it can become, you know, what they'll call in the DSM personality disorder, that you kind of get locked into using this system to cope and and, you know, you get to be an adult and it's, you know, maladaptive and it's hard to connect with society and have good relationships and things like that. So a lot of dramatic kinds of uh, personalities kind of develop, but, you know, it's a way of, you know, again, feeling like if they don't feel things like everyone else feels things, then, then they, you know, again, cut so that they can have a feeling. So I, I also kind of want to throw in there like a, you know, your pain perception and, and again, OCD loops into the, the pain conditions. Um, but, you know, if they're having difficulty, you know, sensing pain, over sensing, under sensing, then, then you're going to have these kind of issues as well. And not everybody perceives pain as a pain. There are people that perceive pain as pleasure as well. And uh, you, you're right, there is uh, uh, a dopamine release for people that have that response. Uh, the, the, the nucleus accumbens, which is your pleasure center, 95% uh, of the cells in the nu nucleus accumbens are pleasure sensing cells. 5% of them are unpleasure. Not the same as pain, but unpleasure. Uh, pain is a sensation the nucleus accumbens is reinforcement. Mm -hmm. So it's giving a thumbs up to the pain sensation that most people would say, well, <clears throat> that that's a negative reinforcer. You're, you're going to reduce the number of times you do something if somebody gives you a painful stimulus, but not everybody reacts that way. So again, <clears throat> the, the, the pain sensation may be detected as an unpleasurable thing for most people, but there are people that pick that up, the same sensation, and you know they give it a big thumbs up affectively. Uh, so uh, you, know, you, you can't uh, judge people's response from an external perspective. You have to find out you know, what's really going on with their perception. Are you familiar with Lisa Barrett's be, research? No. Oh, she, she wrote a book called How We Make Emotions. She's a professional researcher on emotions. It's a, it's a brutal read. Uh, it, it, it'll make you question everything, like just everything. We don't know anything. <laughs> <laughs> That's my kind of book. Asphasia, Bruce Willis. Is that more of a structural uh, thing from a stroke mm. or is there anything you can, can you pick it up with an EEG? What's going on? Uh, in, in fact, we'd have to look before we knew exactly what kind of aphasia he has. Now, he, uh, uh, the news today, uh, or very recent, I saw it today, was that he was stepping down from acting because he has aphasia. They didn't tell us anything about his aphasia. Is this receptive aphasia you can't understand? So you can read the script and comprehend it, or you can't understand what people are saying? Or is this expressive aphasia where you can't 
can't speak, you can't find the words to speak fluently. And it might have been some of both. I mean, the, the Wernicke area and Broca's area have two separate names on them from idiots that stuck their names on brain structures, but um, it doesn't mean that they're separate. If you don't comprehend speech, it's hard to express speech. And so we don't know exactly what part of that overall left hemispheric lexical network was damaged from him, but if he's having symptoms to the point where he's having trouble speaking and comprehending, uh, it's, it's left hemispheric for sure. We don't know whether it's more receptive or expressive. Now, it could be a small stroke. It could be a temporary or transient ischemic attack, like a stroke. A stroke is an ischemic, a thrombotic stroke, a clog basically creates an ischemia downstream from it. But that's a major ischemia. It's not small vessel ischemia, that's large vessel ischemia. You can have small vessel ischemia as vascular change with aging. And I have to say, he's not that old. Uh, he's 67. I'm 72, for God's sakes. You know, if, it, if it's normal for you to have that at 67, I, 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 I just stand in that line. I'm sorry, you know, but um, uh, it, 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 it's entirely possible for it to be small vessel ischemia that kind of crept up on his skill set. Um, it may be large vessel. He may have had a stroke. Uh, if you have a stroke and you recover from it, you don't necessarily recover 100% of your function. You can recover generally, but you may slowly have attrition. Um, I don't know exactly what his case is, uh, but uh, undoubtedly he's lost functional connectivity where it's needed. And we don't know what node of his networks were damaged, but there's probably damage somewhere in his network. If we had his EG data, if it was a stroke, we would see delta in that area, as well as alpha deviations that might be slow alpha. But if it's ischemic, it's a slow edge of alpha. Uh, a, a ischemic supervascular change is seen as slowing of the alpha rhythmicity in that thalamocortical column area. So if your alpha is normally 8 to 12, and you look in the left frontal temporal area where language, you know, comprehension, the, the comprehension is back here, but word fighting and verbal fluency. If that spot has alpha at six, seven, eight, nine, ten, instead of ten, instead of eight to twelve, the slow edge of alpha up there is the reflection of that ischemia. And uh, critical care medicine uh, declares QEG to be perfectly good at detecting and tracking ischemia. So if you see it, you can treat it. If you can treat it, you can track it. So QEG is fully accepted in critical care medicine as a appropriate method for detecting and tracking, uh, uh, detecting the problem and tracking the treatment's effectiveness. So, um, you know, it, it, I, I wish we could see what's going on with him because we, we, we might be able to put him back on his feet uh, so he could continue acting. If it's a stroke, less likely uh, than if it's simply ischemia, but even strokes can have major recovery if you focus on it. So, um, and you know, th that's setting aside whether he's a good actor or what he acts in, uh, whether you're into Die Hard with a Vengeance or whatever the various movies he's had, um, yeah, it, uh, it, it may not uh, it may not be the same as same as uh, uh, allowing Stephen Hawking to continue to speak or something. You know, um, uh, the uh, unfortunately, what he speaks is different than his ability to speak, and we could give him the ability back, but it doesn't make him a better actor. So. Jo Joshua Moore. Owner of Alternative Behavioral Therapy. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Hey, what's the best way for uh, people out in Vancouver, Washington to find out more about your biz? Uh, we have a website, neurofeedbackcare.com. Um, you know, I can be reached there, uh, office at altbehtherapy.com. Yeah. Look for, look for your logo at the end of the show. Sure, absolutely. <laughs> yep. And I, I should say that I... I do appreciate this podcast. The reason why I'm a Patreon supporter would be, you know, information like what Jay shared about uh, which findings in the cingulate, you know, reflect, you know, uh, which, which med outcomes. <laughs> uh, 
Um, you know, I would I'd pay somebody a lot of money to teach me that over a much longer period of time. Uh, and I'm going to go back and rewatch this episode and take notes. Uh, <laughs> you know, I knew half of that, but some of that was like, okay, I didn't know that part. I got to go back and rewatch this, you know? <laughs> well, you'll get an early copy of this, Joshua. Absolutely. Since you're a supporter. We thank you all for listening to NeuroNoodles, Neurofeedback and Neuropsychology Podcast. We'd like to thank our Patreon business supporters and our show sponsors, Mary Tracy's Neurotraining Strategies offers a higher standard of EEG, QEG education to EEG clinicians, technicians, and neurofeedback practitioners with convenient online BCIA and QEG certified didactic courses. Register now at eegstrategies.com slash course hyphen neuro. And then next week, I think, isn't it, Dr. Laura, the sixth annual Super Brain Summit, April 8th at Bradley University, featuring Dr. Bruce Wexler, psychiatrist at Yale Medical School. We'll discuss neurotherapeutics. How can we regulate the brain with computers? Register now at bradley.edu slash superbrainsummit. Tell them Jay sent you. If you have an idea for a topic <laughs> or guest, please email Pete at neuronoodle.com or leave a voicemail with the link in the podcast notes. Please give us five stars on Apple Podcasts and please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Let's get those numbers up. Hey, if you really like us, you can always buy us a coffee on Patreon slash Neuronoodle. We love our Patreon peeps, don't we, Jay? Absolutely. You know, there's different levels of supporter I hear uh, from supporters that get mentioned on the show, uh, people that have little little banners underneath and so forth. So uh, uh, go to the Patreon site and see what level of support you might want to you know, sign up for. We have different ways of turning you upside down and shaking out your pockets. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening. Cue the music. <laughs>